Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was working out what we were going to be preaching about and talking about today, and I realized it was going to be the Old Testament reading about God calling Abram to leave his home and move to the promised land, I just knew I had to use this as the title for my sermon. And I have to ask, how many of you upon seeing this now have a song going through your head right now? Really? Not that many people. Okay, let's fix that. You all remember the old Sunday school song? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. And that we're not going to make you actually start doing it, but this is usually, the way I was taught was then you start to move your right hand, and then you start to move your left arm, and then your legs, and then your other leg, and pretty soon you're just burning energy. I think that's what the point of the song is. Get the Sunday school kids moving, burn some of that energy off of them so that they'll pay attention better. Yeah. I couldn't help but think of that. And you know what the problem is? Is because of that song, whenever I'm talking about Abraham in a sermon or a Bible study, I have to catch myself. Because I'll often say Abraham and I'll want to just start doing. I figure people won't understand. (laughs) So I just resist. It's easy to understand why we would hold this gentleman up as a hero of the faith. Talk about him in Sunday school. Write songs about him. He's seen as a foundation of so much of what happens afterwards in the Bible. The Jewish people, for example, look to Abraham as their ancestor. They took pride in that. John the baptizer, for example, spoke about how the people he was preaching to look to Abraham for their identity as God's people. But it's not just the Jews who look to Abraham as their forefather and ancestor. For example, the people of the Muslim faith, they look to Abraham as their ancestor as well, just through a slightly different branch of the family tree. And we as Christians look to him as our spiritual forefather as well. Paul puts it this way in the book of Romans, he is the father of us all. We like to put him up as a pillar or on a pedestal and show him off as this is what it looks like to have great faith. It's very tempting to do that. I mean, think about what we heard in the Old Testament reading for today. Here, Paul, or, okay, Abraham, time change. I'm blaming that. I didn't get enough sleep. Here, Abraham is minding his own business at home, when all of a sudden, a God he doesn't know, a God he never had worshipped before, that's what we're told in the book of Joshua, shows up and says, pack up everything you have, your family, your nephew, move halfway across the known world to a place you've never seen. How many of you would be like, yeah, sounds good? Most of us wouldn't do that. What does Abram do? He gets out the U-Haul, gets the boxes out, wraps up the china. He just goes. We see other things like that in the book of Genesis. Like the time that God was intending to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, what does Abraham do? He gets up and he says, God, let's negotiate a little bit. And he starts talking to God and convinces him to spare the city if he can find 50 and then 40 and then 30. And he just keeps going and pushing his luck, keeps going. He has that boldness that I think a lot of us would love to have. We look at Abraham and we say, yes, this guy sounds like a pillar of the faith. An example that we should all follow, right? Yeah, not so fast. Because when you continue reading in the book of Genesis and really look at what's going on in Abraham's life, you realize how flawed and broken Abraham was. Abraham was a man with deep-seated trust issues 
when it came to God. For example, shortly after Abraham and his wife moved to the land of Canaan, a famine arose in Canaan. And rather than starve, Abraham had the bright idea of going to Egypt. See, back then, Egypt was sort of the breadbasket of the ancient world. They never ran out of food, or at least that's what people thought. And so Abraham says, we should totally go to Egypt. We will find food there. But Abraham was nervous because Sarah apparently was quite the looker. And so Abraham said, I know what's going to happen. These Egyptian men, they're going to look at you. They're going to want you for themselves. And if they know I'm your husband, they will kill me and then take you. So this is what we're going to do, Sarah. You're going to tell everybody that I'm your brother. Mm. So they go to Egypt. And sure enough... Who notices Sarah, but Pharaoh himself. And Pharaoh proceeds to pitch a lot of woo in Sarah's direction. Do people still say that? I'm getting ready for trivia night, 20s. I'm trying to get in the right mind frame already. Pharaoh is bound and determined to marry Sarah. He's doing everything to set that up when God himself shows up and says, Dude! She's already married. I didn't get that. Did you try again? If you didn't hear that, Siri just told me that she didn't get that. I need to try again. (laughs) Siri does not like my paraphrase, apparently. (laughs) Pharaoh calls Abraham in and says, What did you almost make me do? Why did you lie to me like that? And Abraham says, I was nervous, I was scared. And Pharaoh says, get out. Now what's going on there? What is the deal with this story? Well, back then, people believed that gods had territories. They only had power if they were in their own territory. If you left that god's jurisdiction, forget it. They could do nothing to help you. So here, Abraham has come to the land of Canaan. God has called him there. He's probably figuring, as long as I stay in Canaan, God can protect me. But if I leave Canaan, he can't. The minute Abraham steps foot in Egypt, he's probably thinking, God can't help me. I'm completely on my own. I have to protect my wife and me with my own wits. And the point of the story is to say to Abraham, yo, God's got this. It's a lesson that gets repeated time after time after time, especially around one of the greatest promises that God gave Abraham and Sarah. We heard hints of it in the reading for today. When God says to a 75-year-old man who had never had children, one day all of this land will be given to your descendants. Abraham, Sarah, you're going to be parents. And what does Abraham do with this incredible news? He doesn't buy it. He says, I'm too old. That's never going to work. So he tries to help on two separate occasions. One time he says, you know what we'll do, God? I will adopt my servant Eliezer of Damascus. Now I have a son. Promises fulfilled. And God says, no. Not how it's going to work. Another time Abraham and Sarah put their heads together. They figure, we know what we'll do. Abraham, you'll have a kid with one of Sarah's uh, servant girls. Ugh. Not a great idea, and God doesn't like it either. He says, no, not with Ishmael, not with the son that you had with her. It'll be a son of Sarah's. But see, that's the thing. Even though God said, you too will have a kid, Abraham says, yeah, I'm not so sure that's going to work. 
We hold up Abraham as this giant of the faith, but when we look at him in Genesis, we realize how much he struggled with doubt and uncertainty. It's really not all that heroic when you come right down to it. And you know what? That's true of just about anybody that we hold up as heroes from the Bible. Let's see here. Noah, the guy who built the ark. I was trying to think of a good Sunday school song for him, and I'm coming up a little bit short. He once got so... Yeah, I know. <laughs> Give God the glory, glory. Yeah, okay, that's, that's true. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. <laughs> But Noah, who built the ark, once got so drunk he passed out in his tent naked. Moses, who led the children of Israel to the promised land, struggled with anger issues so badly that God said, no, you can't go in with them. Samson, the guy with the long hair, super strong strength, nothing but a womanizer. Peter, I know, we've been picking on Peter so much lately. Perpetual foot-in-mouth disease, Peter. Do first, think, never, Peter. How about King David? Oh, don't even get me started on him. There wasn't a sin he didn't try out and enjoy. See, this is the thing. When we look through the pages of the Bible, we really don't find heroes. We find broken, flawed, sinful individuals. People who are very much like us. And what Paul says is true. Abraham is the father of us all. We are very much like dear old great, 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 whatever, granddad. But think about how that Sunday school song goes. After we talk about how Father Abraham had many sons and daughters, and many sons had Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you, what do we say? Did you forget already? Let's all praise the Lord. In spite of the flaws that we see in Abraham, in spite of the flaws that we see in all the other people in the Old Testament and New Testament, in spite of the flaws we see in ourselves, we can still praise the Lord. Because in spite of those flaws... In spite of those shortcomings, in spite of our sin, God still loves us. Think about it this way. Why did God call Abraham in the first place? What was it that made him say, I am going to pick this guy and send him to this land and make him a mighty nation and make him a blessing to all peoples? What was it about Abraham that God said, him? Anybody know? We can sum it up in one word. What that word is? Grace. It's because of God's grace that he called Abraham. It wasn't anything about Abraham himself. It was God saying, you are the one I am going to use in spite of your flaws, in spite of your sin, in spite of your doubt and your shortcomings. I am going to work through you to bring about something amazing, Abraham. We heard God talk about it in that reading from Genesis 12. When God says repeatedly, Abraham, you are going to be blessed. You will be a blessing. Through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. God is telling Abraham, you are part of my salvation story. Because of what will happen with one of your descendants. Jesus. He will come and die and rise so that people's sins can be forgiven. And because of that, all people of the world will be blessed. Not because Abraham was so good. Not because he had an impressive resume. Not because he had super strong faith that could never be shaken. But because of God's grace. The same grace that he had for Noah, for Samson, for David, for Peter, for Paul, for all the people we encounter in the Bible, for all of us as well. 
It's God's grace that makes all the difference. I mean, think about what we heard in the gospel reading for today. Think about that infamous verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he what? Are we still asleep? (laughs) For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But it's important to keep reading into verse 17 when John tells us that God did not send his son to condemn the world but to save the world through him. In other words, what John is telling us what we believe is that because of God's grace, because of his love for all people, he sent his son not to find perfect people who already had it all together and were super faithful right away, but instead he sent him to find the messes, to find the wrecks, to find the broken people and the sinners like Abraham, like us, to save us through his grace, to save us through Jesus' death and resurrection so that his grace could transform us. Because this is the thing about grace. When it gets to work in a person's life, it changes them. It transforms them. It empowers them to do incredible things like probably the most infamous story of Abraham, the one that a lot of people think of right away. Eventually, Abraham and Sarah have their son, and they name him Isaac because, well, let's put it this way. At various points in Genesis, when God would remind Abraham and Sarah about the promise of having a kid, you know how they reacted? They laughed. They laughed at the idea. And so when they finally do have a kid, they name him Isaac because in Hebrew, Isaac means laughter. I think it was their way of saying, God, you got the last laugh on us. Well, what happens? Isaac starts to grow up, and one day, God taps Abraham on the shoulder and says, Abraham, you know that son that you love so much? Isaac? I want you to take him on top of a high mountain and sacrifice him to me. Now, the old Abraham, the Abraham who struggled, pre-grace Abraham, he probably would have resisted. He probably would have tried to negotiate. He probably would have tried to weasel his way out of it. But this is an Abraham who's been following God, who's been transformed by God's grace. What does this Abraham do? He gets the wood. He gets the knife. He starts up the mountain halfway up. Isaac looks around and does the math and says, we're missing something. Got wood. We got fire. Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham's response is, God will provide the sacrifice. In spite of everything, Abraham is saying, I trust that God's got this. It goes so far as to Isaac being tied up on the altar, Abraham with the knife in his hand, ready to go before God says, stop. And I think the reason why was so that Abraham could see how far he'd come. Trusting that God has this under control. And what happens? God says, look over there. And there in a bush is a ram caught. So Abraham unties his son, takes the ram, sacrifices that instead. That sounds really familiar. Let's think about this. God provides a sacrifice so that someone else could be saved. What does that sound like? Oh, it's Jesus, right? It's amazing. Jesus is everywhere in the Bible. But Abraham, this man who had struggled with trust for so long, now trusts God up to this 
point. It's an amazing picture of how grace can transform us because that can still happen today. Not just as individuals, but as a congregation. You know what I'm going to talk about now, right? The Next Generation Project. The past two weeks we've been having our cottage meetings. Last one is today yet. We've been having that discussion, listening to each other, trying to listen to God and his will for us. The discussion is not over yet. As a matter of fact, the next step of the process starts this weekend with a congregational survey. It'll be online. There are copies, paper copies, if you don't do the whole online thing in the narthex right now. Because we want to continue to talk. We want to continue the conversation. We want to trust God and follow him where he's leading, sort of like what Abraham did in the story today. Are we going to perfectly trust that what God is doing is right? No, we're not. Because just like Abraham, we struggle with doubt. Are we going to get it? Absolutely right, 100%. Probably not. Because we are broken and flawed like he is. But trusting in God's grace, we trust that he will lead us forward and continue to work in us and through us to transform us. Because, like the song says, Father Abraham had many sons and daughters. Let's be good about this, right? How many sons have Father Abraham? I am one of them, and so are you. So what? Let's all praise the Lord. He's got this. We can trust in him. Let his grace work in us to bring about powerful changes. Right arm. Amen. (laughs) And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.